Well, guys, I'm going to just do a caveat because I don't want people wondering if there's something wrong with me. I am horribly sick. I'm either sweating or freezing, so I've had a sweater on and a t-shirt and then a flannel and a sweater. I, I have so much Imodium AD in me that hopefully I won't poop for another two weeks because I am, I am in horrible shape. Um, I have my Pedialyte back there. If I could just, if somebody wants to bring that one up instead of coffee, because this would be a, just a terrible idea. I'm going to drink Pedialyte during our message. <laughs> it's going to be a weird one today. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So I am, gonna, I am struggling this morning. And I thank you guys for your patience. And if I don't seem as energetic as normal, I'm going to move a little bit slower. I might talk a little bit softer, uh, but please bear with me because I believe that the topic at hand is worth paying attention to. Um, and unfortunately, it's a topic that we don't talk about much. So um, as you can see from our wonderful little uh, happy slide here, we are going to get to know hell this morning by looking at five questions and hopefully the the levity and the cartooniness of this will make such a heavy topic not seem as horrible, but I'm really okay letting God let it be horrible to you. Um, we're going to let the text speak and sit as heavy as it wants to hit this morning. Um, it is frustrating when we look at the state of the church, especially here in America, that we don't see places talking about hell as much as we see Jesus himself talking about hell. And if we are a faithful church, my friends, we should give equal time from the pulpit to the same things that Jesus gave time for. And it seems like this was something that he frequently would bring back up. So it only lends us to spend some time with this. Now, we are walking through our exposition of First Peter. We've been going verse by verse through it uh, almost for eight months. We're just taking a short break. Uh, if you were with us the last week, we did bring up the concept of Hades and hell, and that lended some questions that I've been getting throughout the week by quite a few of you I was surprised by. Um, good questions, but it seems as if maybe it would be good for us to stop in our series and just take a moment and learn a little bit more about what hell is and hopefully get a better biblical worldview of it before we go out, and I do believe this will be... Um, wildly beneficial and hopefully convicting, encouraging, and will change some things for you. So um, I'm not a sports guy. I don't think I have to really uh, tell you guys that. If you've been here more than a few Sundays, you know I don't like sports. I don't watch sports. Um, and I rank sports right there with country music and things that I despise. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm going to try to do a sports analogy. Understand, I'm going to speak with confidence, not knowing anything that I'm talking about, which is a mark of a good pastor. Um, there's a cat by the name of Jason Jarrett who was with the Cowboys in 1996. You see how I just said that as if I knew? Totally had to Google that. <laughs> uh, but he was the third string quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys during the 96 season. And uh, during this season, he never started a game. And he was the backup behind a cat by the name of Troy Aikman. I do know that name. Um, now, he had little to no responsibility as he wasn't the second string. He didn't have to suit up that often. Um, he was able to be the guy that got to watch the game from the sidelines. He never needed a shower after games, which seems like a win to me if you're going to do sports. Uh, and the year that the Cowboys won, I was going to say the World Series, but I've learned that it's called the Super Bowl. Um, and <laughs> I'm not that dumb. Uh, but the year in 96 when they won the Super Bowl, even though Garrett only played in one game and only threw three passes, Mr. Garrett received a Super Bowl ring for being on the winning team. Now, I'm not taking anything away from, uh, from this gentleman. I have zero Super Bowl rings. I uh, would pity anyone that had to catch a football that I threw to them. But when people talk about the 96 Cowboys and what got them to the Super Bowl, what made them great, uh, who made a difference, who worked hard to get them to where they needed to be, I don't believe anyone ever has or ever will talk about the great three passes thrown that season by Jason Garrett. Uh, he made zero significant contributions to the team, yet he has a ring, and no one can question that. Now, why do I bring up this awkward sports analogy for me, that maybe for you guys, you're like, this is awesome, I love sports. Um, I believe that this same mindset, um, this same situation happens in the church frequently where there are people who view salvation in Jesus very similarly. 
they have this idea that all you need to do is believe, go to church or be on the team, essentially, sit, ride the bench, and then when it's all over, we still can get a crown of salvation. We can be the Justin or the Jason Garretts of the Christian faith. Uh, you don't have to share your faith. You don't have to make disciples. You don't have to follow the Great Commission. There's no need to die to yourself. That's for the first stringers. We don't need to repent. We don't have to do anything that involves um, killing and dying to our flesh or any type of uncomfortable actions. Um, we can be the third string backup quarterback for the Christian faith. And our greatest contribution to the kingdom of God is that $10 bill that we might drop every three weeks or every two weeks when we do show up for a service. Um, I think it's a participant trophy mindset that is dominating our cultural Christianity across America, and it's bred from being part of an inclusive society that rejects anything that holds to exclusivity, and that's what's happening today in the church. And it's appalling, sad, and absolutely terrifying to watch this happen. We recoil a little bit against this, and I get it. Um, specifically, our current generation, I don't mean to pick on millennials or the, the newest one. I'm not sure what that one is. Um, but we have this society that struggles to accept the idea that you could possibly be excluded from something. Um, if others are included, then we have to be included as well. And if we've done the same things that they've done, then we should get the same things they do, which is why teachers now give everybody a gold star and tell them that they're special. And that's not the truth at all. Uh, and all of a sudden, when somebody does come up and they bring out that, uh, that 1980s mentality that says, no, you suck and they're good. Uh, you ran faster and they didn't, so you get a trophy and we don't. Then all of a sudden we scream, well, that's unfair, that's unjust, that's not inclusive, you're not being loving, how can you do that, right? We get defensive when we hear things like hell. We hear the word hell and we get uncomfortable. We hear hell and we immediately want to skip that part because it goes against Everything that we want, it goes against everything our culture stands for, which is everybody wins in the end no matter what you do. And if you don't do anything, then those who do win should give you what they had so that these people can feel special. And then it also goes against everything we think a loving God should be based off of our own worldview of God's word. We don't like talking about hell. I get it. I don't like it either. I don't believe any pastor out there goes, I can't wait to talk about hell. <laughs> like, if he does, he's demented, right? Or just having a bad week, <laughs> you know? But Jesus talked about it, as I said earlier. So let me take a look at, uh, let's take a look at our scripture this morning. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. If you have your Bibles or your apps, you can go ahead and open up, or you can read up here on the screen with me. Uh, Jesus says this. He says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. So right here, we're getting the right perspective of man, amen? This is good for me. I've been somebody that throughout my life, a little bit of a rabbit trail, but if it fits, it fits, uh, who really feared man, feared man's judgment, wanted everybody to like me, especially those that are over me. Um, I had this complex of, a, uh, of, a, of an approval-addicted Christian, and this really helps throw that out the window because he's like, listen, the worst that a person can do to you is kill you. You should really be afraid of the person that can kill your soul. And you're like, well, that's a, that's a different perspective I hadn't considered. I like that one a little bit better. So I'm invincible now, right? Um, and he goes on to say, rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This is real clear, man. This is not a hard scripture to interpret. We're not going to have to go into Greek word studies this morning or cultural context. Uh, Jesus is very clear with this one. Be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And he's not afraid to say, be afraid. It's bold. This is, this is not cultural 21st century Western Christianity. Because it would have a Jesus apologizing for this. Hey, have a, have a little bit of a, a respect. You know, he's still your buddy, but maybe respect him a little bit. Because, you know, he, he, he might do something that, well, I mean, he really wouldn't do it to you. But, like, dude, be afraid of God because he could send you to hell. No apologies about it. So we need to teach it the same way as Jesus did. 
But um, I am not a robot. I am a very emotional man. Uh, and I'll be the first to say that I don't like this particular passage of Scripture. Um, I don't believe, at least from where I stand today, God can do a work in my heart and change things, but I don't believe I'm ever going to like this particular passage of Scripture. This will not be my life verse. This will not be the next tattoo I get on my face. Uh, I will not be writing this down on the mirror of my bathroom to read every morning, though that would be hilarious for guests. Um, <laughs> but I struggle to see how a true follower of Jesus could read that Scripture and go, Amen, yeah! Preach! What's wrong with you? Uh, we should find this disturbing. We should have a visceral reaction when we hear this as believers. When we read this, it should bring us to tears. It should break our heart. It should wreck us because it's telling us that hell is real, hell is eternal, and people will be there. Did you catch that? Don't amen this particular passage of Scripture. Don't put it on a flag and run it around town. But in the same sense, we don't dismiss it because we don't like it, right? Rather, we should let the text, when it's difficult like this, do a difficult work in us and bring up difficult emotions, which again is it should break our heart because it tells us that hell is real, hell is eternal, and people will be there. Let me make this more personal. People in this community will be there. People in your family will be there. People you know will go there. People you love deeply here on earth that you have an intimate relationship will be there. If you love people as Jesus commands us to, then you should read this with horror and not with apathy. Do you get that? If you can read this apathetically, then you don't love people like Jesus says to love people. Because he says love everyone. Like, oh, I love everyone. You do understand that most are going to hell, right? Yeah, it doesn't bother me. Then you don't love people. You, am I wrong? Theology and proper doctrine should compel us to actions unless we are just simply hard of heart. A lot of people have great theology, great doctrine, and their hearts are hard because their theology and doctrine is not applied theology and applied doctrine that changes the way they live, the way they respond. When you have a proper doctrine of hell, you will become someone who acts and lives differently. You will become an evangelist, a compassionate, passionate evangelist, if you love people. C.S. Lewis, um, wonderful guy, he said this about hell. He said, there's no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this, if it lay in my power. But it has the full support of Scripture and especially of our own Lord's words. It has always been held by Christendom and it has support of reason. This is the mindset we must take when we deal with difficult Scripture. It is okay for in our flesh to rest with and say, I don't like this and if I could remove it, I would. But then we don't do what liberal Christianity does and say, well, let's just take it out. We say, it has the full support of Scripture, therefore I must concede as God is sovereign, right? This, I, I, don't, get to, I don't get to change this book. This book has to change me. You feeling me? Can, I just, we, we, can we stop doing that? Can we stop changing the things in here that bother us and let the things that bother us change us? Well, I don't like this part. Pretty sure it doesn't matter. <laughs> People say all the time, oh, I just don't think I can because I don't like this part. It doesn't matter what you think. The rock. <laughs> all right. Um, guys, to be honest, man, uh, there are a lot of sections of Scripture if you spend time in the word, um, that should bother you besides this one. Uh, a lot of scripture is extremely disturbing, just like a pastor drinking Pedialyte. A lot of scripture is super disturbing, man. Do you know why scripture is so disturbing to us? Because it grates against our flesh. You, you want to know how you know it's real? Because it ticks you off to no end at times. 
You want to know how you know it's real? Because it offends you at times. You want to know how it's real? Because it causes you to get angry and slam it shut sometimes and say, I ain't reading that right now. Because <laughs> it's going to make me stop doing what I'm doing. And I want to be mad. I want to be selfish. I want to keep my money. I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing. I don't want to reconcile with that person. I don't want to be humble. Well, that's probably because it's real. Man, if you find yourself <laughs> reading the Bible and constantly smiling because it affirms and agrees, not smiling out of joy, that should happen. But if you're smiling and really happy when you read the Bible because it's affirming and agreeing with everything you think or believe, then you should be deeply and concerned about the way you're interpreting Scripture. <laughs> Proper interpretation should cause you to have your flesh come to head with the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? It needs to. All right? Um, when I see someone living a particular life, and it's in gross sin and rebellion to God, and they say, man, I love the Bible. Man, there's a very real chance that you are twisting the word of God. You are reading it through an eisegesis and you are making everything apply to you that shouldn't apply to you and you are failing to see the depth and the gravity of what God's word really is. Um, I want to be very clear here this morning, my friends, the Bible does not cater to our natural nature. The more that I read the scriptures, the more I realize that God's version of justice is very different than my version of justice. God's version of love is different than what the world around me has taught love should be. Um, so when I read it, I'm not surprised when I cringe at things that go against my natural nature. Let me be a little bit more honest here. The most challenging part about this particular doctrine that we get of hell um, isn't just how it grates against us, but it's that it's very experiential. Okay. Um, my wife and I were talking this week about some Christian cliches that are biblical, I don't know if they'd be a cliche. Overused Christian sayings, right? And there's one that uh, it's truthful, and uh, we were talking about it. And for the first time in my 11 years walking with Christ, I actually experienced it firsthand. Like I saw it acted out, and I was like, man, it just, this is a truth of God now, and it's something that I'm going to treasure my heart and not share with, with anyone publicly. It's just something that I was able to witness and see that warmed my heart and encouraged me. And it revealed to me the truth that, my friends, when you experience these things that we develop doctrines about, whether that's the depravity of man, the goodness of God, um, the justification of the elect, when you actually see these things and you experience them, they become so much more passionate and they become so much more compelling to you and the doctrine of hell is no different because it's very experiential in the sense that we've all had people die in our life okay we've all experienced death in our lives all of us here know someone who has died and the moment our theology and doctrine what we believe about hell particularly threatens to negatively affect someone we know then it becomes sometimes too painful to hold on to. Do you know what I mean? When all of a sudden, we have the reality that a loved one who is far from God is dying or has died, it's very hard for us to hold to doctrines if we have not resolved in our mind that we will be unmovable like Martin Luther when it comes to the word of God. And that's what's happening today. We talk about hell as a consequence of sin, right? We talk about it, we, we believe it, and we can teach it from the pulpit, and we can affirm in our Bible studies that hell is a reality for those who do not submit and follow Jesus through repentance and belief. But when death claims your unbelieving teenage son, um, when death claims your unbelieving spouse, when it claims your atheist mother, your spiritual new age father, uh, it immediately becomes very difficult for us to hold to our doctrines. And we want to justify, well, they're in a better place now. We want to say as a way to pacify our emotions, uh, there's no more pain. And what happens is we affirm hell in the comfort of a church, but when faced with the painful reality that someone we love is eternally tormented in hell, it becomes too much to bear. And I'm going to be honest, I get that. I've done too many funerals in the last 11 years. I have another one this week. 
And sometimes I know them, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm very familiar with the family. And I don't think I can count one time in the dozens and dozens of funerals that I've performed where the Christian mother, who knows full well that her son lived opposed to God in rebellion to him, I've never heard one of them affirm a proper theologically accurate fate of their loved one. They always in that moment will resort to trying to protect themselves and say, ah, he's, he's with Jesus now. I don't know if that's the best thing that we should be doing. Death should be uncomfortable. The reality of hell should be uncomfortable because it should compel us to consider the cross and our own mortality and salvation. Why are we so quick to want to sweep it on the rug and say, I don't want to deal with this. I just want to affirm something that I know is not true. We need to let this be painful. We need to let this be uncomfortable. We need to have those strong reactions because God will use death in oftentimes beautiful ways to see people one to Christ when they're faced with the reality that their loved one is getting justice for their life. I'm not rejoicing in that, and I'm not saying it casually. But death is horrible. And if God can give us an opportunity to redeem it by preaching the gospel and talking about the realities of hell, then why are we not trying to do everything we can to redeem something painful like death? It's a sensitive topic to talk about. Um, and I think one of the reasons why is because we're just not honest when we talk about it. Um, I've heard hell preached before <sighs> with apologies. Um, I've seen it taught abusively as if it's a weapon the Christian gets to yield on the unbeliever, which is foolish. Can we just be real? Every single person who believes in Christ deserves hell. You're saved by grace through faith alone, not because you did something good. I mean, just fun fact, <laughs> hell isn't a weapon that Christians can use for an unbeliever. Because you stand just as condemned as they are, you just had the ability and the privilege of having Christ's righteousness imputed to you. And because he did what you couldn't do, you're saved from what you should experience. It's not a weapon for us to yield. But it's been preached poorly, taught abusively. People speak about hell very carelessly and flippantly from pulpits. Um, many have made light of it, been insensitive about it, uh, talked about it very unemotionally, uncompassionately. So you fail to see any humanity in the people's doctrine because their doctrine should be filled with real emotions at times. Every good doctrinal statement, every bit of our theology should elicit emotions, and we're wrong to withhold them from them and make them cold, hard facts. It's a quick way to become a legalist and to be so full of knowledge that you're not doing any good for the kingdom. So what I'd like to do this morning after the world's longest introduction. <laughs> it is what it is. I want to look at five of the most popular questions that I've had people ask me about hell. Uh, these are questions I've asked myself at times, and I think they're important for us to look at an answer to. So uh, I'm going to use so much scripture. Um, if you are a note taker, you want to write these down, great. I'm not going to put them up on the screen because otherwise it would be just flashing like crazy. The reason why I'm going to... Uh, if I don't know if you can say overuse scripture, um, because this is such a sensitive topic for us, right? That I want to ensure that you know I'm not just telling you my thoughts. This is too important to not have this fully supported by the word of God. If we're going to teach on something like this, let's make sure that it's founded in the word of God, not a guy who makes bad choices, opinions, okay? That guy's me. So first question we're going to look at. What happens after a people die? Or we could say what happens after people die. <laughs> I like meeting a peoples. I met a people today. Whew. All right. So let's start by looking at what happens to everyone. Then we're going to look at what happens to the believer. And then we're going to take a look at what happens to the unbeliever. This is going to be quite different, okay? Then we're going to go from there into, well, then what happens next, okay? Because we always love asking that question. Um, this is what kids ask. They always continue to say, what next, what next, what, how, why? So we're going uh, to dive into that a little bit. So the first thing is, what happens when people die? Well, everyone 
um, shares a similar fate in this sense. John chapter 5, verse 28 through 29 says this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves, all who are in their graves, will hear his voice and will come out, and those who have done what is good will rise to live. This is not speaking about moral goodness. We're talking about goodness in the sense of uh, repenting, believing, and following Christ. Okay, just let's be clear here. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. Those who have done what is evil, this is the rejection, the rebellion against God, will rise to be condemned. So everyone has the same fate after death. There will be this physical resurrection of our bodies where our souls are reunited with our flesh and then we will stand before uh, the king of kings on his throne. We will face his judgment. All will be judged, believers and unbelievers alike. So there is a similar fate that all mankind shares, which is the physical resurrection of the body, one to eternal life, one to eternal condemnation. Now, what happens to the believer? Because we would like to get a little bit more information about that. We have some scriptures. One is 2 Corinthians 5.8. Paul writes this, he says, yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I love that one. He's just being real. Like, I think every Christian should want to say, man, when is this going to be done? Because <laughs> I really want to go home. And uh, my kids say that a lot to where it scares me. Uh, my little tiny ones will be like, can we just die and be with Jesus now? And I'm like, you are theologically sound, but you're terrifying. Like, this is morbid but faithful. I don't know if I should rebuke it or encourage it. <laughs> my, kid, my kids take many risks in life. What can happen? We'll just go to Jesus, Dad. Yeah, I, I like hanging out with you. Um, Luke 23, 43, Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's my favorite one when it tells us what the fate of the believer is. Jesus is looking over at another dude who's being crucified with him. The guy just repented and believed confessed Christ as Lord, and he tells them, verily, verily, most assuredly, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. He says, hey, listen, man, you're going to have to sit in purgatory for a little bit. Uh, Catholic Church is going to have to put some coffers in the coffin there for you. Uh, hopefully, we're going to pray enough prayers. We're going to get you out of purgatory in a few weeks. I don't know how long it's going to take. we got some other people ahead of you. Um, and then, you know, we'll pray the right saints, and hopefully, ah, we'll see you soon. He doesn't say, hey, you're going to be an angel. You're going to float around. You're going to go visit your loved ones. And after you float around, visit some people, move some things in their house to make it look like you've given them a sign that you're alive. You're going to come hang out with me. He goes, nope, you're with me. Now. It's the fate of the believer. What that means is your grandma has not visited your house post-death. That does not mean you can contact them through a Ouija board. It does not mean that they are fishing in a lake somewhere in this uh, um, weird metaphysical plane of reality. It means they're with their Lord if they trusted him. That's the hope. That's why Paul says we're of good courage, okay? There's no intermediate state, no floating around, none of this. Death for the follower of Jesus means to be at home with their king, period. Now, for the unbeliever, it's quite different. Uh, I'm going to go into the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 13. If you want to have a proof text, it says, So the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they have done. So right away, we see something very unique here. It says, death and Hades gave up the dead, and once they were given up, they faced judgment. So prior to this universal resurrection, this universal judgment, those who are not with Jesus already in heaven waiting for the glorious resurrection, it says they're in Hades, which I talked about last week, which has spurred this message, which is understand it uh, to be this, this place where the saints of old were before Christ came and rescued them out, but a place also uh, that seems to have a place of of unpleasantness for those who die in rebellion and rejection of him. So this is a, a, a temporary place. Hades simply means um, grave, but we can see that there was those who were faithful in it prior to the resurrection, and it seems like it's still, according to Scripture, from our best interpretation, it seems like this is the initial place for those who have rejected Christ, um, which is important to understand that this is a state of torment they sit in until they are resurrected to face the final judgment. So where the, believe, the unbeliever is at, according to Scripture, from the best reading of it, they're not in hell yet. 
That's a very different word used in the New Testament. It's not to be viewed the same as Hades, okay? So what we should understand is there is this place for those who reject Jesus. They will wait in torment and agony until the final judgment where Hades and death will be thrown into um, a great lake. And those who rebelled will then finally go to their eternal resting place in hell, separate, apart from the divine comfort and love and presence of God. So then what? What's next? What's next? In Matthew 25, 41 through 46, we read this. Then he will say to those on his left, this is Christ acting as king. He's saying, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. And then they will answer saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or as a stranger or naked or sick in prison and, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So I want to give you that text just because it is so important for us to understand that this is not something that we can have various different opinions on that allows everyone to be comfortable. This text is very clear. Those who reject him will have eternal punishment. Those who accept him will have eternal life. And that's the key word in this text in Matthew 25. It's eternal. And we need to let the, the weight of eternity, the gravity of eternity sit on us and it should give us either great joy or great concern depending on where our heart is at. Now, another question that people seem to have about hell, and it's a very, I get it, it's a very prevalent one, is can we receive salvation after death? Because after everything we just read, it would be nice to know that once you see the reality of it firsthand as a tormented soul, you can be like, can I get a redo? Can I get another chance to maybe get this right? And people will ask this. Um, if it seems foolish to you, please don't think that. Um, I think it's a natural response to the reality of eternity. It's to go, wait, wait, wait. That, that's final? A lot of people, unfortunately, especially um, in our post-Christian society, some people have this idea that everyone will be or eventually will come to be won by Christ, either while alive in this world or in death through suffering and hell. They have this idea that there will be uh, an ability to repent and submit to Jesus as, as the flames of hell soften the heart. Uh, and this idea has been around for ages. This is not new heresy. Um, but it never gained much traction because it had zero support in the Bible. So no one ever bothered to try to champion this. But nowadays, we, we say we're Christians and we never read this, right? People claim to have denominations, but they never use this for their, their doctrine. So now that the Bible is optional in the faith world, we see the rise of these ideas coming back up, and it's become very popular nowadays with um, certain individuals. This is a guy by the name of Rob Bell, he was a mega church pastor about 10 years ago. You don't hear him much, too much anymore unless you love watching the Oprah Network. So Rob Bell was a pastor of Mars Hill Church. Um, here, uh, not, not the old one in Seattle that was Driscoll's. This is a different one. So he wrote a book that completely just changed the course of his trajectory. This was a book that had a massive impact on our culture, especially on the, the impressionable youth. And he wrote this book called Love Wins. And maybe you've heard of it, maybe you remember when this came out. Um, it still has an impact today, New York Times bestseller, of course, because it said everything that we want to hear. It said everything we want to hear. He argued that if God is loving, 
and good, then he's eventually going to win everyone back to himself. And after a time of suffering, even the hardest hearts we won to Christ will be saved from hell. Um, he argued this to fight the, despite the fact that Scripture says nothing even remotely like this. There's not even one single Scripture that you would have an inability to articulately, intelligently defend this argument with. But because of his massive popularity, um, because of the culture of our day, this book gained so much traction, and he became fired from his church. But here's what happens, and this is what happens when you turn from biblical doctrine. The church removes him, culture adopts him. He got a TV show on the Oprah Network, and now him and her do all sorts of great stuff, and uh, he is her pastor. So if you want to be wildly successful, reject biblical doctrine. Go with the world. You'll get affirmed. You'll get handshakes. You'll get told that you're, you're on the right track. You will fall from the church, but you will gain the world as your friend. You're going to lose Christ, though. And you might get Oprah. It's not really a selling point for me, though. Um, I think we want to ask this question because it's natural for us to say, man, what if we didn't get enough time here on earth, right? We want to, we, we, we want to somehow justify, well, that person didn't hear the gospel or that person didn't have it presented in the right manner. Um, that person had bad experiences in life that, that caused them to be opposed to the church. But my friends, these are all fallacious arguments. We're told in Scripture that all of creation testifies to the glory of God, therefore man is without excuse. No one has the ability to walk up, even if you've never heard the gospel. You wake up conscious in an adult body with a mind that functions well, and you just walk out outside and you see the world as it is. It testifies that there is a God. And God has made himself readily available and apparent to anyone who chooses to pursue him. So this idea that we can say, well, it's not fair. We didn't get enough time. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. But the other question that we see a lot is our third one this morning, which is if God isn't evil, then why did he create hell or an evil place? I've asked this. I'm not ashamed to admit that. I, I came to Saving Faith 11 years ago. I had all sorts of questions. This is one that kept me in my 20s from wanting to know God. You don't have to raise your hand, but anyone else here been in that boat where you've thought this? None wrong if you have, man. It's a valid question. And for those of you who are saying, I'd never ask that question, well, can you answer it in a way that's loving? And biblical. This is a tough question, man. Um, and if we desire to be like Christ and love lost people, and if the idea that lost people are going to hell every day does break your heart, then you should be able to want to answer this question lovingly and convincingly, biblically, because you are going to want to engage those people, and they are going to have this question for you, right? And your answer better be good. But I get this question, man. I just don't get the if part. I think it would be better if we said, since God isn't evil. Because it's not up for debate. God is good, period. Okay? It's not an if question. <laughs> if God was, it's just, since God is loving, since God is sinless, since God is the absolute opposite of evil, and hell seems evil, then how could a good, loving, pure, holy God create such an evil, wicked place? And we go, do tell. The problem is, this is not a valid question. It is a question that has a logical fallacy because its premise is false. It has a faulty premise. Okay, um, This is not a valid question. This is a question that uh, it begins with an idea that is completely wrong and not true, and that's the premise. The premise states hell is evil. My friends, that's not true. Hell is not evil. Hell isn't evil. I don't know why we think this. Follow me here. If you think I'm off my rock here, like you are on too much cold medication and baby PD light. No, no, no. My friends, hell is simply a place where evil is justly and righteously punished. 
the location of said punishment that God chooses to dole out and its existence for eternity is not evil. It's simply a location. It's morally neutral. You ever thought about it that way? The evil is what is contained within the location. Within hell lies unrepented wickedness, the rebellion of man against God. Within hell lies slanderous hearts and evil and pride and haughtiness of all sorts. Hell itself is once again morally neutral. So when God created this place, he did not create an evil place. He created a place for his justice to be exacted on evil that will suffer within the confines of said location. So in that context, we could actually say that hell is the proper moral response from a just God who must punish evil to continue to be just. The fact that he created uh, hell is in line with his character and nature. To not create hell would be an affront to who he is. He couldn't be just, he couldn't be righteous if he did not create a location that would contain that which is evil, which would need to undergo justice. So, the question is not a valid question, and hell is not an evil place. So let's look at some of these last two questions. This one is a little bit harder. <laughs> this one doesn't have a faulty premise. Not at all. Why would a good God send people to hell? You know, we, we take care of that first question. Why would a good God create hell? It's such an evil thing. Why does he create evil? Okay, well, he didn't. We, uh, let's, we can move on from that. But my next question is going to be, because I've had all of these. I had all of these 11 years ago. Why would a good God send people to hell? Let me say this. For those who are believers in Christ, I want to warn you, do not look at these questions from those who do not know Christ as a challenge that you need to shut down and assert your intellectual dominance over. Do not be that Christian. Do not take these as challenges for you to flex your first year Bible class that you took that you're oh so proud of. Do not take this as a chance to be able to quote your Wayne Grudem systematic theology book to someone or show them very haughtily where scripture says they're wrong. Understand that these questions come from hurt people who cannot truly understand how this works. They've been hurt by the world. These are people who have been hurt by the world. They're far off from other believers. Their flesh is wrestling against the innate knowledge of a God inside of them. And sometimes that can make them angry. It can make them want to challenge you. But my friends, if you who have the truth of light inside you respond to this with some sort of frustration, cockiness, arrogance, or see it as a challenge, you are not doing us any good. I was that person. That's why it's hard for me to talk about it. I didn't need someone to flex their theology on me. I needed someone to show me compassion and to take these questions and answer them with, with sorrow. Because the reality is, this is not wonderful things to talk about. We're talking about souls that are going to be far from Christ for eternity. Let us not be so cavalier, my Christian brothers and sisters, with this. So I want to first affirm the part of this question that says, a good God, okay? So once again, let me affirm, God is good. He is morally good. His will is good, his character is good, his actions are good. The problem is, we have a really stupid view of what good is nowadays. Can we agree with that? The moment you get rid of um, the existence of a God, it comes very hard to hold on to any moral objectivity. Everything becomes subjective. What's right for you is not right for them, but that's okay. What's good for you is bad for him, and love is love and everything's okay. 
we have a very twisted view of what good is. It's influenced by our culture, our fallen nature. It's why books like Love Wins gets written. We are depraved fully, totally. And we feel, <laughs> we feel, we like to believe in our heart that we know what's good. Um, but scripture tells us our heart is an idle factory. So that's not really a good thing to lean on. <laughs> and our view of goodness is very distorted. You know, we look at the idea of eternal suffering and what do we naturally want to do? We want to go bad, horrible, mean. And then we get people who will say only a wicked, egotistical, megalomaniac God would send someone to hell for not worshiping him. You ever heard that? Maybe you thought that. I love um, Christian apologetics, as I've stated many times from the pulpit. William Lane Craig is... is uh, as close to a professor as I'll probably ever get in my life to myself. And uh, when he enters these debates, he eventually gets to the part where the atheistic scholar will just break down and will use that argument. Only a megalomaniac, egotistical God would send someone to hell for not worshiping him. And you're like, wow, no, there it is. You're just mad at God. It's not an intellectual roadblock, it's an emotional one. But it does sound like maybe if we don't know how to respond to that, it's kind of a legit issue, bro. I kind of see it. I kind of could understand when you phrase it like that. Granted, that's a twisted way of saying it. It's, it's, it's out of sorts with what Scripture says, but ah, it, it can be convincing to us. So I want to answer this question two different ways. How could a good God send people to hell? The first way I want to answer this, I want to make an appeal to justice. Okay, um, God is love, yes, but where we really screw this up and we're stupid is we say God is love and then we stop. We say God is only love. You know what I'm talking about? It's that view that God is this like hippie that's going to smoke weed with you in a flower bed with dirty feet and jump around and you're going to sing campfires because God is just, he's just loving and he's just there to affirm everything and hug me and he's my buddy and we've stripped him of any characteristics other than love. God is so much more than just love. He's got so many other characteristics, guys. Check this out. He's morally good. He is righteous. He is just. He is holy. He is vengeful. He is jealous. There's a lot more, man. And the big one is he's just, guys. He's just, he's just, he's just. He is a just judge and he justly judges with full authority, okay? God is concerned about justice being done. And if you say, man, that doesn't sound good, trust me, that's the cry of our nation right now is justice, right? Read the papers. I don't like to get political up here. I try not to ever mention news stories that are happening. But there's a whole community right now that is talking about justice as some sentencing has just happened that's affecting our nation. We want justice, right? Well, that's what God wants too. Problem is, y'all don't want his justice. Right? We want grace. We want others to get justice. Because we selfish. And if you can't amen that one, you lie into yourself. If you're like Pastor Kevin, I don't believe that. I don't want justice. I don't think that's fair. All right, cool. Somebody breaks into your house. They murder your children. And they rape your wife judge sees him he goes ah, I love you get out of here you little scamp you're like all right I'll find him right because you want justice you know what justice is in that moment putting the person in jail to suffer for the consequence of his actions dismissing that horrific rapist, criminal, murderer is not love, it's evil. You would agree with that. We would see that judge on the street and say, you are not a good judge. You're wicked. You're evil. You're unjust because you refuse to bring justice where justice needs to be. But then when God does it, we go, what's wrong with you? He said, like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I'm doing what you would want to do. You just don't like it because it's not in line with what you believe should happen. 
right? My friends, listen. Let me be very clear here, man. A God who doesn't punish evil is not a good God. A God who doesn't punish evil is a wicked God, a lazy God, an unjust God, and not a God worth worshiping. We want God to punish evil. Everyone deserves to be punished for our wickedness. That's key. Everyone here deserves punishment for our rebellion. Everybody in this room deserves punishment for our failure to live 100% according to his word. Everyone deserves hell. Which is why grace is so awesome. (laughs) Which is the fact that Christ would even look at someone like us that deserves to be punished eternally and say, I got you. That's insane. Now, y'all, but we don't want justice. We want mercy. And when we want justice, we want it on our terms. God is a God of justice. My friends, without justice, without consequences, he is not simply a bad God. He's an evil God. So he must, to be a good God, send people to hell. I do also want to make one other one, and I think I've kind of, um, as I talked a little bit, maybe touched on it, so I'm just going to say it in a quick two sentences, not read my whole manuscript here about this, but I made an appeal to justice. I want to make an appeal to sovereignty. Um, God being sovereign means God is above and before all things. God's will is supreme. God has the right to do as he pleases. He is one who created the universe and all things in it. He is completely independent of anything. He answers to no one. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, and we are his creation, and we are his subjects. I will continue on by saying his ways are unquestionable. His will is unchangeable. His methods are not our methods. His ways and thoughts are higher than our ways and thoughts. He has the freedom to do whatever he pleases, whenever he pleases. That is the sovereignty of God, if you did not know that. If you can't believe that, then you haven't reached Christianity yet. Okay? This is who God is, all right? He has the freedom to do as he pleases. He is perfect. We are imperfect. He is loving. We, as people, are prone to hate. Maybe you're feeling like you hate me right now for what I'm saying. It just proves my point. (laughs) He is kind and we are wicked. He is patient. We are impatient. He is holy. We are depraved. He is merciful. We are vengeful. And because of that, the only thing we deserve from God is hell. And if God, I'm not saying this is the truth, but I want to make an appeal to sovereignty. If God did want to send everyone there, that would be fair. Just sit with that. If God wanted to condemn every single person, he would be well within his sovereignty to do so, and he would be right. I don't believe that a Christian can ever appreciate the beauty of their salvation until they accept that fact. If you wake up somehow thinking you deserve your salvation, you've earned it, it was owed to you, if you don't fully understand that you deserve the wrath of God poured out on you for eternity for the thoughts that you have on a daily basis, then you will never appreciate the grace that was given through salvation, justification, regeneration, and sanctification, my friends. You just won't. Theology changes things. The heart's got to be in it. We have undeserved, unmerited grace. So to that, I give that answer, how can a good God send people to hell? The better phrase would be, can a sovereign God send people to hell? And that answer is emphatically yes every time. So let's close with our last one. Is hell forever? Well, um, two dominating schools of thought with this one in Christianity today. Uh, The two schools of thought, these are non-divisible issues. If you're wondering, like, hey, Pastor Kevin, I hold to this one despite all the biblical overwhelming evidence. (laughs) I'll be like, that's cool. We can still do life together. You can still enjoy being part of Ford's Church. We don't get divided over this. This isn't like you reject the sovereignty of God. This is just simply a different doctrine, but uh, you could hold to the other one. I just think it is a weak view that we hold to because we just really don't like the thought of people being punished. It bothers us, so we try to find a way to make Scripture reconcile with what we think is more loving. Eternal conscious torment and annihilationism. Right? Just casual words that we use in daily conversation. All right? Eternal conscious torment is one view. The other view that people have is uh, they're annihilists. 
annihilationism. So this first view, which I'm just going to abbreviate as ECT, it's held by the majority of evangelical Christians today. Um, this is the view that we hold to here at Forge, um, that I believe is the most biblical view and the most probable based on faithful interpretation of Scripture. And here's what this view states. It states that those who are in hell will endure never-ending conscious torment. And the supporting Scripture we've already read today, and that was in Matthew. Uh, where the word eternity, eternal life, is said for the follower of Jesus, and they contrast that with the word eternal punishment for those who reject him. So uh, I think the best way to interpret the Greek word for eternal is eternal. <laughs> this is really a tough one. Uh, the word eternal actually means e eternal. It's, it's not rocket science. Uh, we just want to find ways to do exegetical gymnastics and jump backwards and bend upside down because we don't want the word eternal to mean eternal. We want it to mean for a short time. Right? Again, because if, if you want that because you're compassionate. If you know people in hell, you, you, you're like, I just can't be short. Because this really is, this, I don't like the reality of it. I get that. My dad's in hell. I don't say that in a cavalier manner. I've accepted it. Died eight years ago, roughly. Um, opposed to God. Presented the gospel to him many times. He said, oh, I definitely believe in God. I'm like, Dad, that ain't enough. Scripture says even the demons believe. And they shudder. You're not shuddering, Dad. I think I'm just going to go fish on a lake whole eternity like, bro i've seen you fish that sounds horrible you're gonna just fight with yourself for eternity you're gonna hate it that sounds like the worst version of eternity ever my dad's in hell so i get the idea of saying man does eternity really mean eternity can we somehow interpret this differently we can't man i believe this is the best explanation of the text but i see how a case could be made for annihilationism and this view the second view teaches that those who die rejecting God, they never receive a resurrection, even though Scripture says that. And I've read those proof texts to you. Um, and their souls just kind of lay unconscious until this final judgment for Jesus. At that time, um, they, they receive their judgment, for a, and it, it burns them up instantly, or they cease to exist. These are, these are silly arguments. And again... Let me say another warning to those who are Christians that, uh, that like to flex their theological chops. If you shut someone down with this, with a lack of grace and love, understand that you are probably shutting someone down that holds to this view because it's very personal to them. Again, uh, there is no tolerance for you trying to show that you are smarter than someone else and beat down their doctrinal views on this, lovingly teach them and correct them because a lot of these views when it comes to hell, the person that holds this holds this because... They're the one that just lost their significant other. And by you telling them that they're silly and foolish for thinking this, you're missing the heart behind that person's views. Can we finally stop being arrogant Christians that are so impressed with our knowledge and become a little bit more compassionate when we speak to other believers and other Christians on topics that are really difficult? I think, we, I think we'd see a lot more people, one, and a lot more relationships restored, my friends. Um, give you an idea of where this comes from, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So they will say, well, you have everlasting life in here simply is for the believer, therefore those who aren't, they'll never experience that. So uh, it's, it's pretty weak, guys. Um, I, I don't see any merit to it, but I understand why you want to believe it. I understand why we'd want to. Um, the doctrine of hell is rough, man. It's rough. Now, here's the thing. Why do we talk about hell? Um, sometimes I think talking about hell seems like a cheap threat by a pastor to get people to believe the gospel. You ever experienced that? Maybe... Maybe the younger generation you never have, but like, do I got people here over 50? You don't need to raise your hand and point out the fact that you're almost, you know, a century old. I just stated a fact. But maybe for those who are maybe over 50, do you remember the days of like the Southern Baptist preacher with the hanky and the suit that turned into just like a tank top by the end of service? 
and he'd just scream in hell at people, and hell was used as like a marketing tool to get people to believe in the gospel, and you're like, you did no earthly good here, you know? Um, but oftentimes when we talk about hell, we use it as a cheap way to scare people into believing the gospel. Now, I will say that we don't have the right to make it not scary. It is, by its very nature, terrifying. I don't believe we should lean into it to try to elicit emotions of fear in someone to have them come to Christ out of fear. That's not real salvation. But we do need to allow it to be weighty. I mean, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. To me, that statement of Jesus seems like a threat. Well, it is. It's not a mean one. It's, he, it's the truth. And depending on what side of the field you're on, it is a threat. It's the reality that there's something terrifying coming at you. Unfortunately, people have used hell as this cheap scare tactic, and they don't really teach it, examine the subject. So um, I think we naturally have a negative response when someone says, I'm going to teach about hell. Hopefully, we've done what we can to mitigate that today, and you've been able to come with me on this journey, and I've given you enough emotions and tenderness and uh, honesty to not be guilty of that. Um, but the reality is, my friends, we need to talk about this. Jesus did. He talked about it a lot. He didn't shy away from telling people to fear hell. Uh, he spoke about it with urgency, which we need to. He spoke about it directly without apologizing, which we need to be able to do. But yeah, it is a threat. And my friends, that is not a bad thing. See, as a pastor, you guys are my flock, and that terrifies me. If it terrifies you, I'm sorry, but it terrifies me. Because I'm charged biblically with a mandate to care for you. I am charged with overseeing the faith of everyone in this room to teaching you and growing you and that is a burden that freaks me out every single day i'm terrified by this i don't know who in the right mind would desire to do this you do it because it's a burden that you answer but that's a lot of responsibility to have and i'm not doing my job well if I don't warn people who God has told me to care for about the consequences of not believing. And if that means we pull out texts like this that are maybe threatening, I'm okay with that. And you know why I'm okay with that? Because I got kids. And here's what I mean. My kids are dumb. Not all of them. Kaylee, I'm referring to the one in the front row. The ones that aren't here, those are the ones that are dumb. <laughs> they're not old enough to play YouTube yet. But what I mean is they're like, maybe they're not dumb. They're just... They're just unaware of the realities of the world. We live um, out in the country on this highway, and my little ones get excited. And when they get excited, they run and they scream. And somehow they have no ability to see anything other than joy. So they run into things like what? The road. Ever, we've all done this as parents, right? You've forgotten your kid in a car, or they ran the road. Maybe that's just me. I'm sharing too much. But what do you do when your kid's playing in the road? What do you do? Oh, I don't want to offend them. I'm just going to let them figure it out. Because if I say something, that could hurt their self-esteem. And they're just special. And I, wa I just I want to affirm and just build them up. So you play in the street. Like, no, you a stupid parent. What do you do when your kid's on the road? For me, Zeke, get out of the road. Ah, Zeke, get out of the road. Ah. And then I yell. And I say, you are going to get hit by a car. Your brains are going to get smashed. Your bones are going to be everywhere, and you're going to be dead. You're like, you taught your kids that way? Well, sometimes my child needs to understand the grave consequence of his foolish actions. I have done that to my kids. I have helped them understand the reality of what suffering and death look like if you play in the freaking road, because I live in the country. That's not loving. That's the most loving thing I can do as a parent. The stupidest thing, the most wicked thing I do as a parent is say, oh, y'all figure out life on your own. I don't want to stunt your little growth. Special little snowflake, here's a participation trophy, go to school. I love you guys as my congregation enough to teach you truth. And if that caused you to hate me and not come back, so be it. But I'll do my best to 
to try to express that I wrestle with it too. And my heart breaks as well. And I'm not saying it to lord it over you, but I say it because I love you. And I hope that you received the teaching this morning well. If it offended you, that's okay, let it. If it compels you, that's okay, let it. If this caused you to consider your own mortality, your own morality, and your own eternity, please let it. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much uh, for giving us uh, such an amazing, wonderful plan to escape the wrath that we so justly deserve. Thank you for your son. Thank you that uh, you've given us grace upon grace. You've abundantly offered us mercy when we, do, when we deserve nothing but it. Lord, I understand that I do not deserve the salvation you've given me. I understand rightly so that I have not earned this, nor can I ever earn this. I understand deeply that it is an act of grace and mercy lavished upon me by a loving God. And I just thank you for that, and I would pray that my congregation would see that too. Father, help us not to ever be comfortable with the doctrine of hell. Help us to always be people that are recoiled against it, that our bodies kind of revolt against it because the reality is there are, there are lost souls who are going there, and you've told us to love everyone. I would ask, if anything, this spurs in this congregation a motivation to go and share the gospel with everyone, no matter how awkward it makes them feel. Because there's nothing more awkward than staying at a funeral of someone that you could have shared the gospel with. Lord, help us to shrug off our uncomfortability, to be bold with the word of God, to see more lost people come to the knowledge of you, to not use scripture, theology, and doctrine as a weapon to berate or abuse or as some sort of pride to make us feel like we are smarter than another person. But Lord, let our doctrine and theology be coupled with a passion and a heart for you and for lost people. May our theology drip with compassion and tears as we preach it to a lost and dying generation. Thank you for the grace that you've given me to, to allow me to preach this morning and the energy that you've given me to, to work in a day that uh, I, am, I, I did not think you could. So Lord, uh, you get all the glory and all the credit. Um, and I look forward to resting. Thank you so much uh, for what you do for us, for who you are. In Christ's name, amen.